Wow, <laughs> you start the recording right away, don't you? Yeah, I have a setting. I have a setting that uh, whenever I start a meeting, it starts recording automatically. Oh, oh. So I joined before you actually got the meeting started. Yeah, so how was your experience of that? Were you actually allowed into the room or were you sitting in a, like a waiting room and saying the meeting host was started soon or something like that? No, I was let straight into the meeting. Okay, fine. That's perfect. Which is, I mean, you know, the BAA does that too. Oh, here's the big new. I came, I came prepared, sort of. Oh, look at that. Very good. <laughs> okay, so yeah, we still have a couple of minutes until the official start time. Your name isn't, despite my name, as you can see, <laughs> right. um, your name is not easy for me to say. Zbigniew oh. Stachniak, is that yeah, right? I'm, yeah, I'm also known as, uh, especially among my uh, car dealers, as Ziggy. Ziggy, okay. That makes it easier, I guess. But there's also a Ziggy in the British APL Association who, who yeah, shows is. up most meetings. Oh, we have lots of bubs as well. Right? So. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's... Uh, if I had a choice uh, of my name some time ago, then I, I would definitely go for something different than Zbigniew. Um, Zbigniew. But it is, right. And, and the CH is a H or...? Yes, it is. So Stachniak or something like that? Yes, exactly. Oh. Hey, you got it right. Zbigniew Stachniak. Thank That's you. not that bad. Can you say my name? Because I can't. <laughs> Well, uh, I would be challenged so many times today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't worry, it's a very laid back kind of thing. It's not a, it's not a test and it's not, uh, it's not like cross examination or anything like that. No, I, no I, I understand. It's just to, to warm our web bodies in the, this unusual time. Yeah. Um, what a great idea. I, I, I would like to congratulate you on uh, starting it and and, uh, and keep uh, keeping the fire going it's a really wonderful idea I, I wish i knew about this earlier well you can you can see all the recordings of the previous events of but, course uh, yes, that's very true right um but it's not the same thing as actually being here for this yeah i think i it was actually inspired a little bit by my father he passed yes. away uh, nine years ago um and he had lots of stories to tell oh. and i don't know one day i thought that hey we, before people are can't tell the stories anymore we should give them a chance to say to, to tell it over for the new generation so right yes. now the uh, the uh, the main reason why i do history of computing is exactly uh, the stories i mean it's it's just wonderful and um you don't know when to start, when to end, starting with things like, uh, you know, Roman abacus uh, 2000 years ago and ending on um, what we do right now. So, so stories is everything for me. And I, this, is, this is every time I have a chance to talk to so-called pioneers of computing, uh, then uh, my blood pressure, pressure is going up. So it's, it's nice to, uh, to listen to all these wonderful stories. When you were building things with a piece of wood and a wire, and it, it was a telephone, right? <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay, well, this is our starting time. More people might be dropping in later, but it tends to be like a, a handful or two of people here, and then it's, of course, recorded, and a lot of people okay. go and watch it later. Time zones are an issue um, as well. So um, most of the guests we've had so far and have been people that were previously known to me. So I grew up with APL and uh, I heard lots of, about lots of people if I didn't see their names in conference proceedings. Um, but I, I, you have been publishing things in conference proceedings, maybe be speaking at, at the APL conferences as well. Unfortunately, uh, the names Big Nivis Stachniak did not seem familiar to me. And, but then I heard about what you'd been involved with and I thought, well, that's spot on for this. So um, tell us a little bit about uh, your history, involvement in APL and um, 
well, you've obviously been involved in, in some of the design and development work of, of APL systems. That's what we're here for. Right. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, thanks for inviting me to uh, and giving me a chance to talk about something that I spent some time ago, uh, some time uh, investigating and something that is very, very close to me. Uh, however, uh, let me start with an anecdote. Um, you mentioned that my name was not familiar to you before we connected. Uh, things can get really on my side very bad. I remember once being invited to a, a history of technology conference. And um, so I entered the room and uh, there were lots of people and there were some elderly ladies sitting in very, very front. And um, I turned on my computer and the, uh, the slide appeared, um, something about history of computing, of course. And I hear one lady talking to another one. And I thought that it will be a talk about Catherine the Great. Uh, my, my wife is a writer and uh, she published uh, quite a few uh, history books about Catherine the Great. And, <laughs> so the name may be familiar, but not exactly mine. And, uh, so I, I suffer by the popularity of my wife. Anyway, uh, let let me let me um, move to the uh, to the subject, MCM computer. Let me let me begin with a sort of disclaimer. I I did I did not work at MCM at all. Uh, uh, the company that designed the MCM seventy computer and some sort of pseudo historians were writing that I was. No, I was never involved in, in any work on that. Uh, my knowledge of this MCM computer and uh, the corporate history of MCM is uh, uh, from my own research and my conversations and interviews with uh, former employees of MCM. So just to clarify that, I'm a historian of computing. And, and um, at some point, I sort of rediscovered the MCM story. And that's my connection uh, with that subject. Um, so what was the MCM 70 computer? Why is it important? Let me, let me start with that. Let me start with a short answer. And then I will move to the full story. Um, so it is my opinion that MCM was um, arguably the world's first practical mass manufactured uh, personal computer. It was the first such computer built around a microprocessor. It's the first microcomputer. Um, it came with built-in APL and sophisticated operating system at the time when, when these things were not really new. We are talking about very, very early 1970s. Um, the company that manufactured the MCM-70 uh, named Microcomputer Machines or MCM uh, was among the first firms to probe the full potential of microprocessor technology for the design of uh, computer hardware. Uh, it was definitely the earliest company to embark on the commercial manufacturing of a PC. So that's, uh, that's an interesting fact as well. They actually started their work on, uh, on their MCM-70 even before the Intel 8008, uh, which is the heart of the computer, was, was put on the market. So it's, it's, it's very, very early. It can be early. You can start earlier than that. So that's the short um, answer to the question, uh, what was the MCM-70, why, why it's important. So let me tell you the full story and uh, about the computer and uh, about MCM's uh, romance with APL. That's, that's, that's why we're here, right? Um, um, so a brief timeline. Um, the story really, really starts in, at the end of 1960s. Um, a Canadian entrepreneur by the name of Merz Katt uh, was hired by Queen's University as a math professor. And had nothing unusual to hire someone as a math professor, uh, but he had nothing to do with mathematics, but uh, he was very well known um, as a computer guy. By that time he was called in Canada the king of computing. And Queen's hired him not for his mathematical skills, but to run computer center. Queens was, uh, Queens University is one of the oldest degree granting universities in Canada, but around the uh, 1960s was far behind other universities in terms of computing and Kat was hired to fix it. Um, so here he comes to Queens and looks around and what he sees, he sees uh, 
brave few professors uh, doing some computation. And of course, everything was mainframe, ba mainframe based uh, batch processing and so forth. And around 69, he figured out that actually the way to, to deal with, with all the problems that we know, which are associated with batch processing, and especially when there are students involved, hundreds of students and professors, is to do something else. And this is when he came up with an idea of a small desktop APL computer on a desk of a professor or a desk of a student. So that's the beginning. Uh, but the technology was not there yet. So it was a nice idea, but uh, idea is not enough. You have to have a uh, technology um, uh, at this stage that you can do some implementations of that. So let's go to 71. So two years later, um, on the, actually December 71, he incorporates CAT systems, uh, later renamed as microcomputing machines or MCM. Um, the purpose uh, of that company was to manufacture computers for personal use. So that's uh, December 71. And uh, actually there were two guys when the, the, when, uh, when, when the company was incorporated. So one was uh, Miss, uh, Mr. Cap and another one was Gord Raymer actually from my, he was working that time at my university, at York University. Um, and eventually Raymer would design MCM APL, so APL variant for this little computer. And before joining MCM, uh, he was, uh, he designed the uh, York APL, a, um, a version of uh, uh, APL 360 um, that was installed on some universities and some institutions. But soon after uh, the company hired uh, hardware guys, uh, Jose Luraya, that he would be leading the hardware design team and under Arpen who would be designing the operating system and virtual memory for the computer. I will get to the configuration of the computer later on. So in uh, 72, in, in early 72, so a few months after incorporation, um, they started experimentation with Intel um, 8008 that eventually will be uh, powering uh, the computer. Um, the, computer the, com the company also figured out what kind of market they were after. So uh, the MCM was to be inexpensive, general purpose computer that would, and let me quote uh, here from uh, 1973 MCM promo brochure. So that computer was to bridge the gap between the sophisticated calculators that offer simplicity of operation, but fail to provide the information processing capability of the computer and the large complex computers that require such high degree of training and expertise as to place them beyond the operational capabilities of most people who wanted to use them. So that's, uh, uh, that, that's the ideology. And the, therefore the MCM70 was to appeal to both computer, science, to computer experts and uh, novices alike. So that was, that was uh, what they were trying to do. So mostly 72 and so half of a 73 is building several prototypes, experimenting with, uh, with a microprocessor and, and, and uh, doing more and more implementation of APL. So then comes May, 1973. And that's very important date if someone plays the game, who was first, who did something first and so on. So what happened in May, 73? There is a fifth, um, international APL conference in, in Toronto. I wonder if anyone was there. Um, and during that conference, two things happened. I think um, IBM announced its uh, um, new version of APL, SV, I think, during that conference. And at the same time, MCM presented the prototype of its computer. So there was a presentation. Now, not much is known about it. And I mean, there are no written sources on actually to know what happened, what kind of stuff they were presenting, what was the reaction to that presentation. Yeah, I of course interviewed some people. And so some people said, oh yeah, it was so enthusiastic. I mean, they, they, they really wanted to buy. And other people would say, oh no, no, nobody, nobody was really interested. Um, the, the majority of the crowd was so in love with their mainframes and what they do in terms of APL computing on them, that they looked at it as a toy. So I have no clear picture of actually 
the reaction to the presentation. However, I, I recently wrote a paper, uh, sort of of speculative nature, what could uh, have happened there, what kind of stuff they could produce. So first of all, I know that, that they presented a prototype uh, which had no um, external storage. So it was just a box and you could in, enter stuff from the keyboard. So obviously, knowing also that that computer was powered by a very slow processor, that you could actually demonstrate simple things, simple wine line uh, APL code and see how, how, how the computer is managing that. Um, as I said, due to uh, lack of external storage, so you could not bring uh, uh, longer code. Um, Obviously, there is a possibility that some of the people would challenge MCM and say, well, sh show us something more exciting rather than adding two numbers or creating a little matrix. Um, so for instance, someone could ask, uh, I don't know, to generate uh, 255 integers and to divide each of them by 0.7 uh, using say IOTA operation. And that would require a little bit of time. And actually that prototype would probably take around a minute to produce the result. Actually, I did a test on one of the MCM 70s in our museum and the machine took 50 seconds to produce the result, right? So most likely they will be staying away from it and controlling the presentation. As I said, that was one of the early prototypes of a computer. So that, that is important thing. They demonstrated that eventually this is what we will have on our desks little things that can do a lot and uh, that they can operate with powerful uh, powerful software. Well, it was already running the the AD08 processor, right? Right, that's right. No, no, from how the point of view, it was almost ready. And actually, uh, we don't have that particular prototype in our museum, but we have schematic diagrams of the computer and we have piece of software, operating system of it. So the operating system was already ready to accept input IO to do IO with with uh, with cassette drives. This is what eventually they would do, and and uh, and um, APL was was almost complete in terms of implementation. There were minor changes uh, when you look when you compare what was in the prototype and you have that and uh, what was available with a production mode. So so a lot of things were ready, but. But, but as I said, they, they probably had still problems with, uh, with power supply. Obviously they had problems with power supply and with, with disk drives. Uh, on the prototype, there are photographs of the prototype. There is no space for any external hardware, for any built-in um, hardware like cassette drives on the production model. Um, there were no ports to connect. So that was really, really a, a demo. But but the pure computational power of the device would be approximately what the production device would do, no? That's right. That's right. So, so dividing well, a, a hundred uh, two hundred and fifty-five numbers in floating point operations taking a minute sounds awfully long. It was not that slow the processor. So it would inefficient coding or something. Uh, but I can't I, I can't really say. But I I, I think it is uh, probably the combination of implementation uh, because you have to you have uh, you, the, something that I would be talking about a little bit later the 80, 8008 had significant lim limitation uh, so it's not only the speed yeah you could probably deal with a little with speed a little bit but the, the, the main the main two problems were lack of directly accessible memory it was only 16k uh, so if you if you if you if you adjust the 16k for RAM for workspace, there's not not really much. What can you do with 16k, right? Um, and on top of this, um, in 8008, you cannot save. Um, uh, you, you cannot have interrupts that will save the state. So interrupting and sa saving uh, what the computer is doing, doing something else, and re returning to it. So there, you, you had to deal with these two problems. So the way MCM was eventually doing was they were, they invented the virtual memory and they were swapping RAM for space on cassette tapes. That's Just, going to slow things down badly. That's right, <laughs> to, do, to, do, uh, uh, to, 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 to have larger uh, workspace, right? 
So eventually, instead of say 64 Ks, they had up to 200 K of space available to, to the user. But, but as I said, the main problem was the memory, memory limitation, that was the, that was, that was the killer. All right, so, um, so that, that's, that's, um, that's May. Now let's go to August. There is another Congress, this time in Denmark, APL Congress in Denmark. And what the MCM did, something really spectacular, they prepared a portable a battery operated version of MCM7. Everything was packed, the hardware was packed into attache case together with batteries. And this time the computer had a built in cassette drive so it could demonstrate um, um, more sophisticated codes. And it was a sensation, the demo. For some people, the sensation was that you could have APL in such a small box. But the funny thing is, because there was um, the, 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 the day after the presentation, uh, Danish Daily Politiken wrote a two page article about the demo, about the sensational computer. And, 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 and there are some quotes from participants of a, <laughs> of a presentation. And, and a lot of people were actually amazed, not by the fact that there was an APL in there, uh, but that it was, but there was no power cable anywhere. So they, they thought that there was some kind of a cheat. There was something underground and so on. So they were searching around uh, for a power source, but it was better operated. So, so that was that was that was amazing. And MCM took that um, um, article and um, uh, this nice review, and they they decided to go on a European tour with that prototype. So they were going. Uh, to places like France, Germany, Holland, Italy, Switzerland, UK, and they had uh, they attracted considerable attention, and uh, and they had really wide uh, uh, press coverage. And let me find a quote that actually summarizes uh, sort of the the, uh, the response to this presentation. Look, here it is. Uh, there seems little doubt that Canada has stolen an early world lead in the new era of distributed computing which will bring the dream of computer in every home and office closer to reality. So here you have sort of uh, zooming on personal computing. Uh, all right, so that's, that's September. This is the huge European tour. Uh, back in Canada, the end of September, there is an official unveiling of a computer. So it, it took place in Toronto on the 27th of September, then the following day in Boston, uh, I'm sorry, in New York, no, 25th, Toronto, 27th, New York, and 28th in Boston. And when they were announcing the computer, they were talking about microprocessor, powered desktop computer, and here's another quote, of a size, price, and ease of use as to bring personal computer ownership to businesses, education, and scientific users previously answered by the computer industry. In the coming years, the computer field is going to be made of millions of small computers and a limited number of large computers. So here you also have sort of a declaration of new computing paradigm, right? There will be no big monsters anymore in basements of um, banks and corporations, but the majority of computations will be done on small devices such as the MCM7. Right? So this, this was a spot on prediction where everybody else thought right. something else at the time. That's, 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 that's very true. This is, this is the era where where uh, uh, mini computers started to dominate the, the marketplace, right? And suddenly they are coming with something much, much smaller. Portable, personal, right? Nobody was talking about personal computing. And that, that was also a problem because when you are first with some idea, oh yeah, you could be bringing computers to homes. And I remember beginning of personal computing, a real one, home computing. The main issue was what to do with it, right? So, so it, the challenge was not only to design, to design a, a powerful computer around a very, very weak uh, microprocessor, but actually to justify um, uh, that, that, that businesses, schools, and so on need and will benefit from such a device. And I think they did quite a lot of, quite a good job on that in terms of at least uh, producing uh, um, uh, publicity material and, and, and promoting um, the use of the computer in, in, in education and banking and so on and so on. I will get to that in a moment. Uh, 
another quote uh, that, that gives you some idea about what they were after, the simplicity of the MCM-70 and its associated computer language known as APL make personal computer use and ownership a reality. So it's a nice connection. And there would be more about it that actually, uh, if you ask MCM at that time, what will make that computer personal? They will all answer, yeah, that hardware and that keyboard and so as well. But they would say the language, the, lang the APL language, that, that is a part of what will make it personal, right? Um, enjoy the privilege of having your own personal computer. It's a privilege no computer user has ever had before the MCM Cemetery. Good luck and welcome to the computer age. That's, that's, uh, that's propaganda. Uh, but, but it gives you some idea. This is, as I said, 1973, right? And this uh, welcome to, com to the computer age, you will see this phrase repeated later on by Apple, by Atari, uh, Radio Shack, and so on. Everybody was welcoming everyone uh, to computer age. And that's, uh, that's in my opinion, the earliest uh, uh, phrasing of this idea. All right. So forwarding now to 74, there were other, pre there, there, there were other presentations all over North America, but uh, the production of the model, the, 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 the computer was finally ready in, in mid 74. So this is where you have the uh, beginning of mass, ma mass manufacturing. There were some delays, uh, which I don't want to get into. Uh, yes, uh, they are described in my book in detail. This almost resulting in the uh, collapse of the entire enterprise that power supply. But anyway, uh, so after that, the computers were sold in North America and in Europe. Uh, among the institutions that acquired the MCM 70s were Chevron Oil Research Company, Firestone, Toronto Hospital for Sick Children, Mutual Life Insurance Company of New York, Ontario Hydroelectric Power Commission, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, the United States Army, CIA, the Soviet Academy of Science, and several universities. So all over the place, all over the place. Now, uh, financial institutions loved MCM70 because MCM70 together with APL provided them with uh, spreadsheet-like opportunities. So they sold quite a lot of uh, MCM70s to banks and, and, and insurance companies and so on. So. Now, it's interesting that among the two first MCM70s sold were, were two bought by IBM for what they describe research. Uh, in a few months, when, in September 75, actually, IBM uh, announces its APL desktop, the IBM 5100. And this is when the competition between MCM and IBM starts, begins. Now, I couldn't really get any details on what was the degree of MCM 70s impact on IBM 5100? Maybe there was, according to some MCM people who were at this May 1973 uh, presentation, they said that there were IBM people there and after presentation, they, 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 they almost wanted to take apart the computer. So there is some indication that there was an interest in the machine, but to what degree? Uh, IBM uh, in the past also was interested in building small APL machines. So maybe there is no connection. So I don't want to uh, really go into speculations, but that's, that's what happened. I mean, the first two machines went to, to, uh, to IBM. So briefly about uh, specifications. So if you bought this little 8008 powered computer, uh, this is what you had. So inside you have Intel 8008, that was an 8-bit uh, microprocessor. Uh, uh, RAM, 2 to 8K, depending on how much money you had. Uh, ROM, between 14 and 32 kilobytes. So they used bank switching to actually extend ROM, because this is where APL was sitting. This is where operating system was sitting. They needed the time, so it can why it was slow, because if you wanted to access some APL functions and they were not in the, the uh, real ROM, you had to do bank switching and to access uh, 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 the code. So external, sto external storage, um, um, there were two built-in uh, cassette drives. One cassette drive was, was just uh, for user uh, functions in data, another uh, drive, cassette drive was used for virtual memory. And I will tell you a little bit about this in a moment. 
uh, peripherals, uh, not uh, during uh, the announcement, but in 75, MCM offered, uh, you could connect MCM to printer plotter, punch card reader, modem to interface, uh, MCM 70 to other computers and to access APL time sharing systems. So this is what you could uh, do. Uh, there were lots of interesting features, hardware features such as power failure protection. So when power was off, the computer would gracefully save everything uh, with the entire workspace on like, one of these cassettes because they were building, there were batteries inside. And and there was a graceful shutdown. And uh, when, uh, when the power was restored, the batteries loaded, the entire workspace was brought in. So like, like magic. So things like that. Maybe too much is one of the reasons why well, there were always delays in, 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 in putting um, this product on the market. It's, it's really it's amazing what they've done with, uh, uh, with the technology available. Um, then you have display, so it's a built-in plasma display, a new thing by Boros. Uh, you could have uh, one line only, 85 characters, up to 85 characters, but you could see 32 characters at any given time. So you had to move the window in a sense to see the code if the code was longer. Um, programming languages, there is only MCM APL built in. Um, there were some attempts, underground attempts at, do, at, at doing an offering basic uh, but uh, that was considered a, a, a revolt, so there was never anything anything else. MCM also offered an APL um, applications library. Now, let me tell you a little bit about... You would keep the main tape in one of the two drives and then you load that's it right. in another one? That, that, that's right. So, uh, so um, the idea was that you copied what you needed from applications library to your user um, um, tape. So you had on the tape, whatever you wanted. And the other cassette drive was typically used for virtual memory for some, something more advanced. So the, the, the virtual memory, if, if, you, if you activated it it, 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 it will be used, it will use the entire drive. So nothing could be placed there. So the other drive would have to be shared uh, between these libraries and, and, and user defined functions and, and pieces of data. So the, yeah, they produced a lot of tapes, economics, engineering, and, and things like that, and, 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 and even games. So, so uh, yeah, uh, some of the earliest uh, uh, PC games are, have been, uh, and they were designed for, for MCM 70. All right. Um, so uh, what about uh, system software? Um, so there's, a, as I mentioned, an advanced operating system and it consisted of two modules. One was called Easy, one was called AVS, and user interacted with OS via um, commands which were APL-like. Uh, so for instance, there was no on-off switch. Basically, you press the uh, return key and the computer was on, and to power it off, you, you, you typed quad off that, that was uh, the, the, that was the, the extent of uh, turning it on and off so easy that was external allocation system that was basically io utilities for digital cassette based storage and uh, nothing else so typical io typical your dos operating system right abs was a virtual memory and as i mentioned the lack of memory forced mcm to to develop their own uh, virtual memory that was at that time available only on a few mainframes. Um, and MCM70 was swapping uh, functions and data between one of the drives and, and RAM. And, and you had uh, 100K uh, of extra memory for that, right? So that was quite, quite, quite a lot. Uh, APL, uh, so the, the choice of programming language was, was critical to formulation of uh, the personal computer concept and MCM. And for CAT, who started all of that, uh, there was only one choice and that was APL, right? So there was nothing else. Uh, and the MCM 70 was to be as simple to use as a pocket calculator. And for MCM, that simplicity was rooted in APL language. 
very concise. You have one screen, a uh, one line plasma display. What can you do? It's uh, and, and, and because uh, of, of, of APL syntax, you could squeeze quite a lot on, on, that, on that single a single line. Right? But how did that work then? It, yes. One of the core things in APL is, I don't know, it's not core thing, but one of the traditional things in APL is that if you create a matrix, it actually looks like a matrix as opposed to a flat thing. How did right. it deal with multi-line output then? Uh, well, you, you display this line by line. So you, 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 you press to enter and you will have the next line, the next line, the next line, right? Or uh, if you want it, you could squeeze some of the code on one line, right? Just separating com uh, 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 commands. Um, no, but for the output, so it, it had a possibility, did it remember its own output? So you could go back up and see oh, what- Oh, right, absolutely, absolutely. And, ah. and on that display, this plasma display in the right corner, uh, there was a little space, so instead of that, there was one space for one character, character, and that space was reserved for some information what's going on with your output. So there was an the information there is more output, press enter. There is still more output, press enter, or you can go back. So, so there was a little that, that little sort of um, um, symbol that was indicating what's how the output looks like. And what you can expect, how you can navigate. It's a then precursor later, oh, to the to the scroll bar, right? Right, something like that. And and eventually, when you had a printer uh, available, then one of course you could print um, uh, the the entire outlook as as uh, as stored in memory. Right. Uh, so. In, so MCM was very, very happy with, with their APL. And uh, they said, well, it's uh, the set of AP, MCM APL uh, and arithmetic operations is so rich that you, you, the user, you can use the computer right away as, as a advanced calculator before moving to more complex tasks. Um, as I mentioned, uh, MCM APL was designed by Gord Raymer between 72, 74. And the idea was to have it as close to IBM APL 360 and IPL um, as, v, as, as possible. Um, as close as possible um, because there were some differences. So it's a, really a variant of APL, um, not, uh, not APL 360. Um, and the main reason for that, I already mentioned uh, the speed of 8008 and limited memory um, and um, the interesting thing is because, of course, there were critics right away, but now well, it's not exactly 360. Um, so to mask these differences, uh, MCM present, pre presented its, uh, its dialect as a personal uh, language, um, a direct end user programming tool. Uh, I have a quote, something about this. Okay, the MCM APL was designed to be simple and easy to learn so that the non-programmer professional can quickly learn to express his own problems in his own way. And how quickly? Uh, MCM claimed that the user could begin computing with um, MCM APL after only a few hours. Uh, and eventually it would find that, and here's another quote, APL gives an almost astonishing capability to solve complex problems right from accounting, finance, inventory, forecasting, to engineering with the shortest programs of any existing computer language. So this is, you can see how in love they were with, uh, with APL. All right, uh, connecting all the dots now. So MCM personal computer, simple to use for almost everybody and APL. And this is, I promise the last quote that I found, but this is a very early again, the promo, literature uh, from 1973. So here it is. Uh, APL is the simplest and most powerful programming language yet developed. It is capable of handling problems that wouldn't be attempted with other languages. These features make APL the most effective conversational language in the computer world today. And the MCM70 with its full implementation of APL, mm, a most significant advance in the development of interactive computer technology, right? So that's connecting everything with simplicity. And uh, he really thought that MCM will change the world. And I think there was a possibility if uh, certain things 
went uh, in a different way. But anyway, so in the end, so what happened then? So we are talking about 74 production, manufacturing, selling uh, 75 peripherals. But in the end, uh, for several reasons, uh, these reasons were financial, personal, etc. The company failed to capitalize on its early lead uh, and the newly created desktop computer market. And by 76, there is only sporadic interest in MCM, judging from publications in newspapers and magazines. Um, and, and that's it, more or less. The company was dissolved in 1982. They manufactured other models, MCM 700, 800, 900, MCM power and mini power or something like this. So they manufactured uh, several um, um, generations of computers. All of them were APL, uh, but they were marginal players on the uh, desktop market. So that 82, uh, in principle, that's the end of the story, but here it is the fun part, at least for me. So, so 82, let's go, go forward to 1999. Uh, during one of my trips to, to Paris, I was sitting in uh, Mitterrand Library, flipping the pages of uh, um, electronic magazines from early 1970s. And I saw an interesting little article with an image of, uh, of a person identified as Merskat operating a small desktop uh, device called the MCM70 and was described as a microprocessor powered APL computer from Canada. Now, I was puzzled a little bit by this because I was of an opinion at that time that there were no microprocessor powered desktop computers. Um, on top of this, APL uh, was available only on mainframes and uh, there, was a, there, there was a discussion how to bring APL to mini computers. And this little thing really looked like a, like a, um, a typewriter. It was typewriter size computer. Actually, that photograph was a, was of Cut and the prototype that he took on that European tour. But I, nevertheless, I decided on my return to Canada to investigate the story. So uh, I went on the internet and um, searched for Merskat. There were no hits for MCM7. Merskat, three hits. There was one person selling a computer, uh, selling a horse somewhere in Ontario. Uh, there was Merskat, who was uh, an employee of a company called Air Games, uh, designing games for, for, for passengers flying on airplanes. Uh, I went for specific, specified others, and there was no Air Games company there. So, and there was the, the third hit was that Merskat was a captain of Tennis Canada. Uh, he took his team somewhere to South America and Canada lost 5-0 something of the games they lost. I contacted um, Ten Tennis Canada and asking for further information. They gave me an email. I sent the email. Merskat uh, responded, yes, that's me. I invented MCM7. So, I've got the guy and he said, no, 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 we built that, we designed, manufactured, the story is true. What do you want to know? When, when would you like to meet? And that's the, that's my beginning of, of really deciding what happened that, uh, that, um, that the world uh, has totally forgotten about this early initiative. Um, so that was um, in sort of 2000. In 2003, after doing research and media and interviews, I published the article in the Annals of History of Computing. That's uh, front page, nice. Uh, the story of MCM and um, got very nice feedback. And um, so that's 2003, but in September 2003, uh, it was coming, uh, there was 25th anniversary I'm sorry, 30th anniversary of unveiling this computer in, 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 in Toronto. It was September, September 73, and we are talking about September 2003. So I said, well, there were several newspapers, top Canadian newspapers during the original event, unveiling event, let them uh, write again about the, 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 the computer to the, uh, to the newer audience. 
which they did. They actually published two-page articles on uh, on the original event and uh, and with interviews with Kat and me with photographs. Uh, very very nice, but I, I I was expecting that that would be it. But um, as we now say it, the story went viral around the world. Um, it's it's just just unbelievable. And uh, from zero hits on the internet um, in 2000, uh, 2001, I checked yesterday. Um, there were forty four million hits for MCM for MCM seventy. And then I typed uh, INIAC, and it's only three million, right? Um, so it's still <laughs> thing is is going uh, going uh, going uh, uh, quite strongly for uh, for uh, the for the story for the computer for the story. Um, since then, I and others published several articles, and 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 I published a book in 2000, 2011 Were most of what I know about it is published. Later on, I realized that I missed the entire story about software. I saw that I was so involved in actually building this computer from nothing and the corporate story and the dramas, the, uh, the banks, the venture capitalists and so on. But I forgot about, about the story of software that MCM was involved, personal software and so on. So in, in some of my articles, I did I did that. Um, maybe at some point I will I will add that to the to the to the book. All right, that's not the end of the story um, of my involvement there, because after finishing my research um, on MCM and publishing uh, the story here and there, I was left with uh, with a few banker boxes of interesting material interviews, software, hardware, promo, literature, manuals, photographs. And that's 2003. And at that time, there was no computer museum in Canada. So there was no good place to, uh, uh, to deposit that material. So my department uh, decided to, to start a computer museum in 2003. And the objective would be not only to to save uh, MCM material, which seeded the idea, uh, but also to, uh, to collect research and promote the computer industry in Canada, to build a, a research collection dedicated to the history of computing in Canada. So I, uh, uh, let me say that after almost 20 years, uh, um, we have really wonderful resources uh, uh, that are able to, um, uh, not only for research, but we have frequent visits from writers, journalists, filmmakers, and so on and so on. So, so it is working very, very nicely. Um, so the, M the MCM material seeded the museum and um, because MCM 70 is an APL machine and also because in Toronto, we had at some point this impressive company by the name of IP Sharp Associates. Uh, we decided to build and create an APL collection, uh, APL archive. And um, we're searching for all sorts of material. We are still searching. Uh, but I think after so many years, our collection, APL collection, is probably one of the, mo one of the largest um, of such collections. And we have all sorts of material. Um, and not only manuals, uh, but also corporate documents, photographs, interviews, co various codes and so on, so software. Um, we, we have, uh, as far as companies being represented, it's not only IP Sharp and MCM, but we have a range of companies, um, uh, uh, STSC, J software, and so on and so on. So, so, so we are trying to not only focus on uh, Canadian APL connections, although our museum is dedicated to history of computing in Canada, uh, but as far as APL is concerned, we would like to have a global picture. Um, now, one of our, as far as speaking about collecting APL material, so one of our original objectives and still is one of our main objectives is to recover um, the very famous 
IP Sharp library. And everybody I was meeting uh, a decade ago or even earlier would say, well, if you want APL material, you have to find uh, IP Sharp um, uh, library. Now, this library disappeared after uh, IP Sharp was, uh, was uh, acquired by Reuters at the end of 1980s. Nobody knows what happened to that library. Bits and pieces, some manuals, some books are around. And every now and then, we are getting a manual or a book with a stamp IP Sharp library. So we have some of that material, but, but it's a fraction. So we're still hunting for, um, for more, at least to have some idea about the scope uh, of, of that uh, collection of, of documents. All right, um, so that's uh, APL and MCM70 story. Um, let me conclude with, um, by taking this actual opportunity to mention one of my current projects, which is also APL related. Um, although I'm done with MCM and with MCM70, I'm still investigating APL, but this time I'm looking at, <laughs> the use of APL uh, in computer generated art or computer supported art. And there was some interesting work done uh, with that. So in, in the early 1980s, Ipsanet was used for several uh, interesting worldwide computer network art events. Uh, there were APL art galleries uh, during a couple of conferences in the 1990s in Toronto. Uh, was there anything else? Um, well, if there was, I would like to hear about this. Please let me know. Um, so I'm in contact with several people who did actually uh, support artists in their early computer art ventures and APL uh, was used for a variety of purposes. I would like to learn as much as possible. We are thinking about building a virtual exhibit of uh, APL supported computer art as one of our museum's visual exhibits, uh, but we are still uh, um, building the full picture of, of, of that involvement. There's a lot of computer graphics produced with, uh, uh, with APL software, uh, but to do graphics does not necessarily mean uh, that you are creating a, a piece of art. So one has to be uh, careful with that. So please let me know if you, if you know something about that. And I think there was a, a somewhat well-known composer who is using APL in his compositions. I'm sure I can track down what the name, his name is. That would be wonderful. No, and, I, uh, I and then I suppose, as you say, it's easy to, well, it's common to do uh, graphics, but uh, movies is supposedly art, right? Right, obviously. So uh, a couple of movies have used APL yeah, Stanley Jordan. That's what Brian, Brian is saying. Yes. So the composer Stanley Jordan used APL in his, for his music. Um, um, the couple of movies have used, early, early on, have used APL for, for some graphics. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and Brian is mentioning Tron. And uh, I think they say like a, a Disney movie or something, an animated uh, movie, like a musical type movie that used APL as well. Um, ah. So there are definitely some things, and well, yeah. If, 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 please let me know. Please send me an email if you if you if you yeah, have a sure. on that. But but no, I'm a very I'm very pleased for these these hints. Uh, and as uh, as I mentioned, I'm just learning about this. I I don't have a full picture of the scope um, uh, of of the the use of APL. But uh, you know, there is there is so much work done on on computer assisted art or computer art. It's uh, it's enormous to write about this. Is like to write about about human produced art. Period. It's it's, it's impossible right now to capture that. Uh, however, uh, the connection with APL is interesting, and and that will be something new and probably something interesting for people who visit our museum online. There's still something going on even today. Uh... A, a former employee of Dialog, Marshall Lochbaum, who now 
uh, is developing another array language based on on APL the ideas from APL. He has also composed some music himself and uses he earlier used uh, J uh, mm -hmm. for for APL, and now he uses his new array language BQN for composing some music, and that's available even online. Yeah, oh. The code for it, I can certainly send that to you as well. So Thank yeah, you. That's, that's wonderful. Yes. Um, Okay, well, we are, get, we are getting close to, to the end of the hour. Um, if anybody would like to ask questions, now is your chance. Yeah. I've got a, a couple of comments by getting in. I don't know whether I'm heard. Yeah, sure. Go for it, Bob. No. Um, yeah, one, I, I didn't know MCM in, in those real early days, but uh, after I moved to New York in the 80s, it had to have been then. Um, there was, a, I remember it at, at, at uh, uh, like PC expos and things like that. Uh, I did see, particularly I remember an accounting company that was using MCM. So it must have had a later, later version with somewhat. Um, right, right. So one of these MCM power computers, right? These were the last, yeah. the last on the market, right? Yeah, because it was a more, but still, it was extremely early. I mean, that was early. So that was pre-PC. And of course, 68,000 came out and everybody figured that Phil Van Cleve's, uh, you know, APL, that's what I got as the first uh, downloaded mainframe uh, systems from uh, IP Sharp. Um, one other thing, uh, Judson Rosebush, um, uh, digital effects uh, was uh, the company that created the the mainly it's a lot of logo sequences for Tron and also had the bit part, which is very APL ish. But um, uh, yeah, they uh, Judson they would use Harris time shared Harris computer and they'd run overnight to go uh -huh. and do um, little 15 second uh, pieces of animation to, to do like um, the um, CBS Sports Spectacular logo, but that was their market was, was the, you know, to go and do short little pieces of computer animation uh, mm -hmm. that would be inserted into uh, commercials. That was the only thing that could afford, again, overnight, borrowed time on a Harris computer. Oh, I see. Uh, uh, are you in touch with that gentleman? Pardon? Judge? Are, are you in touch with him? Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. Could, you, could you please connect me with, with him? Some e oh, interaction sure. or something? I can, uh, I've got, uh, well, his, his email I know I have in my, my mailing list and oh, so okay. forth. But I can no, I, I can I, connect the two of you by email if you if you're okay with that. Yeah, Judson, um, I met Judson and digital effects at the uh, uh, SIGGRAPH 79, mm. where I uh, displayed my, my six cube logo done the hard part in, in APL was, was solving how to draw with a single continuous line back in CalComp days. But uh, met Judson then and um, man, he, he definitely was one of the, the you know, great pioneers of, uh, of, computer, of, of, of computer animation. And the reason why he could beat the market is because of APL. That's um, fantastic, thank you very much for, for that information. Yeah, huh. one, one other interesting thing. Judson had, uh, how do you get to, to, to uh, Carnegie Hall? Well, Judson rented Caruso's old studio and that was his office. <laughs> Anybody else for anything? Uh, yes. Uh, do you have an operating MCM 70? Ha. Huh. My, uh, my, my short answer is, is occasionally. So there's a very, very old hardware with uh, lots of dangerous components there, mostly being capacitors. But 
tend to explode when you power that thing on. So one day with, uh, with the help of a few experts in powering old hardware uh, safely, we did that. And this is how I did the tests, these IOTA tests and came up with 50 seconds. Yeah, I see you have uh, videos of YouTube on YouTube of this, right? There must be years. Right, but this is another MCN70 that was required recently by one of the computer, uh, vintage computer enthusiasts uh, in Toronto. And, and he actually helped me to debug and time some of our programs with this, with, we decided not to use our own machine. And he was brave enough to, to even um, uh, run a few demos, a few games, and we looked at that. Just to give you an idea, I was uh, what, what was going on. I was uh, in the process of putting final touches on MCM70 emulator, which is now available uh, for Linux platforms. And uh, so when it was ready, the, the last stages of the bagging of the emulator, I noticed that when I'm doing some computation, some strange junk appears on this uh, uh, little display, uh, this plasma display. Some patterns flashing pixels. And so I was not really sure what was going on. So I asked that hobbyist to, to run his MCN70 on the same code. And the funny thing is that the same thing happened and exactly the same strange patterns. So I started to investigate the thing and it turns out that uh, MCM70 didn't have separate uh, display memory. It was display memory was part of RAM. That's fine. Uh, but because of the shortage of um, RAM, what MCM did was when the computer was doing calculations and display was not involved, the display RAM was also used for calculations. Right. It would be reflected on the screen when it did yeah, so. Exactly, exactly. So all these uh, partial results would be, you know, all these bytes would be shown as... Ah, uh, but that, that yeah. meant that a very clever programmer would be able to write graphics to the screen instead of, instead of characters. Absolutely, absolutely. So, 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 uh, so thanks to experimentation with one of these MCM 70s, existing 70s, um, 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 I could confirm uh, at least the uh, emulation of the design on our emulator. But now the emulator is in such a state, it's, it's pretty historically accurate. So, uh, and it runs original operating system, original MCM, APL, and so on. So everything is original. So every investigation that we do concerning software or hardware, we really do investigate the emulator. How is, the, is it available anywhere, the emulator? Yes, yes, yes. If you go on uh, our museum, your university computer museum, yeah. Uh, and you go under research, I think, and there is MCM70 emulator. Ah. And oh, I and see the main connection with Judson Rosebush. She's on Facebook. Well, so. I, well, yeah, I'm not. <laughs> I can appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> yes. Ah, but if they, okay. Oh, but so, it's, so it's possible to obtain the, the emulator from the museum. Right, right, right. I wonder I, how it works with copyright when the, when the company is completely gone, with nobody taking over. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, um, it's unresolved. I, have the, I don't think anybody is claiming anything, but uh, the only thing that, I, that, that we use is uh, the original operating system. And so the content of ROMs, the MCM APL. I don't think anybody has any rights anymore. And and the guy who designed uh, MCM APL, Gordon Raymer, he's fine with it. So no. Oh, so if you have specific permission from him, and maybe even Merce Cut is still alive, right? Yes, yes. So if you can get permission from from the two of them, he would be the one that would own the rights to it, I suppose. Right. Uh, so, Mascot has nothing to do with anymore with that because before actually the machine was put on the market, he was kicked out 
of his own company. Oh dear. And signed all sorts of papers preventing him from even mentioning the term MCM70. So, so he is out. The only person who, uh, there was Gord Raymer who designed uh, the operating system. Unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago. Uh, so the only, the only uh, person who may claim some rights to software is, is Gord Raymer. And so you should, have you put a note there that he has said that it's okay? Because would, that would make it easier for people, for at least for some people that are worried about that to, to I, use I, it. I, I, I don't remember. I have something to that effect, but uh, um, uh, regarding rights to the uh, uh, to um, MCM APL. What is it? Uh, what is it written in the emulator? Or how does it run? Well, it, it's in C. It's in C. Well, it would be it would be very uh, cool if it could be exposed to an online thing, so you could go to a website and actually try right. it out. Oh, well, so there, uh, what, there, there is a um, a person in in the U.S. who actually made it. Uh, I think it's the last stage of testing, uh, and so the emulator would be available on on, uh, on 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 the internet on the on the web. That would be so awesome. Right. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So again, he, he claims right now that everything works and I tried to confirm that from my uh, box and I couldn't. So just a, probably a week or so and then it will be available online as well. You should let me know and I will put uh, a link. I don't know if you've seen the APL wiki, uh, yes. but they're trying to collect all, all the information I can about everything there. And I'll certainly put a link there. There's, there's a link to be able to run uh, 5100 there or 5150 or something like that. Uh, as well, um, so it would be cool to have this in the collection. Sure, you can you can right now put the link to that emulator that I have. Yeah, uh, sure. as soon as, as we have is available, we'll expand it. Nice. Okay, if there are no more questions, then uh, you need a huge thank you for coming here and telling this. You're basically giving a giving away your book for free by by speaking all this. Uh, <laughs> so Amazing. really really appreciate that, and and this is a chapter. <laughs> Right. A chapter of APL's history that I knew very little about, so definitely been been learning a lot of stuff. Right. So it's you're right. It's it's my APL book uh, with a few deleted scenes brought back. <laughs> yeah, publish an addendum, or if you uh, feel free to to go in and edit the or tell me what to edit on the on the MCM 70 page on the APL wiki. If you want to add, as you said, your book fo focuses most on hardware and there are things that the software we left out, which is obviously the most connected to, to the question of APL. Absolutely. So that might be a place to publish it if you're interested in that. And on, on, your, on the History Museum's uh, website, of course. But uh, right, right. It's, it's open, it's free for everybody like Wikipedia. So. Very good. Will do. Thank you so much. Really appreciate this. I'm sure everybody here enjoyed it very much. And uh, yeah, well, feel free always to join in on, on the APL campfire. We'll, we'll be back in uh, four weeks. And uh, at that point, we are um, we are going to have Charles Brenner as guest, who is doing this uh, DNA analysis using APL and has also been involved in the early days of, of APL and developing, implementing APL. So it's going to be great. Meanwhile, thank you oh, so much. Thank you. thank you very much to all of you and please stay safe. Curtis, it's very nice to see you again. And I hope that uh, we'll have a nice glass of uh, Chardonnay in uh, warm California at some point or somewhere else. Again. I bought Dag Spicer from the Computer History Museum who's, who comes from Canada uh, would show up. He did, he did say that he was planning to come to this meeting, but uh, oh. he must have gotten caught somewhere. <laughs> Very good. Fine. All the best to all of you. Bye. Bye.